you've got a grasp on the language of photography, it's time to take a look at the action of photography, framing and composing a shot. In order to do that, we need to examine a few fundamentals of any visual expression, visual elements and principles of design. These art fundamentals are the building blocks of composition. The visual elements that make up the ingredients of any work of art are lines, shapes, form, value, texture, light, space, and color. And composition is the term we use to describe the placement or arrangement of these visual elements within a work of art as distinct from its subject. Composition means putting together, and it applies to all works of art, from music to writing to photography, that are created with conscious thought. I like to think about composition and the visual elements in terms of building a house. If you want to build a house, you need to use several individual components to make the whole complete structure, right? To start, you need to make a frame, and then within that frame you have to build interior walls to support it, then you have to run HVAC and wiring and plumbing to link the rooms together, and then you have to put the decorative finishes on it to make it a functional house. Before starting a piece of work, an artist has to work in the same way. She starts by finding a surface or site which will act as the frame or support for the whole thing, and this could be a canvas, a piece of paper, a wall, an outdoor space, or, in our case, a digital space or frame. And then she constructs the artwork within that framework by using the visual elements. These eight elements are more or less universal to the study of art and design, and have been studied since the Renaissance. I teach them to all of my art classes because they're so important in shaping how we imagine and see a piece of work. In photography, we use the camera to record an image. So, you may be wondering how you create a photograph using the visual elements, the way that you might paint or draw lines or shapes on a canvas. The answer is that you don't. Instead, you train your eye to look for these visual elements within your subject matter or landscape, so that you can use them to help you compose a good, effective, compelling image. So for the next little bit, I want to walk you with you through each element, and I want to look at how various photographers have used them in particular images. I'm going to begin with line. It sounds like such a dumb question to ask, what is a line? We all know what a line is, right? In art terms, a line is the path traced by a moving point. When you sit down and start taking notes, you're actually drawing lines. Your handwriting is made up of lines that are uniquely yours. Lines have many functions within a composition. They record and establish boundaries, and they convey direction and movement. Photographers often look for lines to help define the space of the shot and to help reinforce the illusion of 3D space on a 2D plane. Looking at this image here by Louise Lawler, you'll see several lines. The lines of the window pane are pretty obvious but there are also the lines created by the white partition wall, by the tabletops, and even by the cords connecting the light bulbs. All of these lines add up to create a sense of space within the image. We can tell that we're in an expansive space because there are two tables and perpendicular to those are both a partition and a set of tall, corporate looking windows. I immediately wonder what kind of space I'm in, so right away this image is compelling to me. Our eyes tend to follow lines, even when we don't realize it. So often, photographers use lines to direct our eyes to focus on particularly important parts of the composition. This type of line is called a directional line. If you think about it, these lines echo the body's movement in space. Horizontal lines follow the direction of the body at rest, and so they imply calm. Vertical lines follow the body standing upright, and since they defy gravity and go upward into space, they seem assertive. Diagonal lines often suggest action because they mimic the direction of the body leaning forward in motion. You can see in this image by mid-20th century photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson that he's captured many different directional lines. Take a second to see how many you can identify. How do they articulate the space captured by the photograph? How do they help you get the sense that you're looking out into a distant landscape? And how do they separate the space of the village from the open countryside in the distance? If you begin to train your eye to look for lines like these, you'll find that framing a good shot gets easier and easier. The next most basic element is shape. If you've taken math or geometry, you know all about the named shapes. 
In art, the definition is a little broader. It is any two-dimensional form that occupies an area with definable boundaries, and boundaries can be defined by a couple of different things. A line, a shift in texture, or a shift in color. Shapes are two-dimensional, so we talk about them a lot in photography. If we were talking about three-dimensional space, we'd talk about form or mass. Shapes can either be geometric or organic. Geometric shapes are exactly what they sound like, shapes that approximate regular, named shapes like we've known since we were two. Organic shapes are irregular, and they evoke the living forms of nature. Photographers often look for interesting shapes to help divine spatial relationships within a shot. As you can see in this photo by Zeke Berman, it's chock full of geometric shapes. Right off the bat, rectangles and squares dominate the image. In this case, he's used these shapes to confuse our idea of spatial relationships. What looks at first glance like a table with objects on it is actually a pile of scrap cardboard and wood shot at such an angle that it appears to be three-dimensional and standing upright in the room. In this image by Jan Groover, we see a combination of geometric and organic shapes. In the left, we see squares that tell us we're looking into an interior space that contains a more organic bottle. And at the right, she uses the organic shape of the bottle to let us know that there's space behind the box on the left. Here, the spatial relationships are mysterious. What exactly is it that we're looking at? And finally, in this image by Brian Ulrich, you can see how he's used the same basic shape over and over again to literally hit us over the head with banality. We know instantly that we're looking at a boring, mundane grocery store shelf. I'm compelled by this photo because I want to know why he's trying to find beauty in something so dumb. When we talk about spatial relationships among shapes in a composition, particularly the relationships between shapes in the background, we talk about the figure-ground relationship. The figure is the shape our brains focus on, and the ground is all the surrounding stuff, or the background. Manipulating this relationship is something that photographers can easily do using things like depth of field and some of the other grammar terms that we talked about in the last video. By changing her depth of field to focus on the person at the background of this photo, Donna Ferrato has left a blurred, anonymous shape of a human figure in the foreground. So she's manipulated the figure-ground relationship and our expectations as the viewer. The person who is important is not the figure closest to us, but rather the person farther away. Shapes that we perceive as figures we call positive shapes, and shapes in the background we call negative shapes. Here's another image by Louise Lawler, and you can see the play between positive and negative shapes that she's captured in this shot. The positive shapes of the pedestals sit against the negative shape of the interior space all around them. Another way photographers and artists keep their work visually interesting is with texture. There are two types of texture in art, actual texture and visual texture. Actual texture is the physical surface quality of an object. In photography, we're concerned with visual texture, or the illusion of surface quality or actual texture within an image. In this image, Guillermo Schrodek Hart used a wide-angle lens and a deep depth of field to capture the visual texture of lots and lots of raw meat. How does seeing that texture and crisp focus affect how you feel about the photograph? What do you think we're supposed to interpret from this image? Pattern is another textural element photographers can look, up, look to for help in composing a compelling image. Patterns, which are repetitive motifs or designs, can create a visual buzz that flattens the space. Here, Michael Wolfe has shot the exterior of a high-rise apartment building, but since he chose to focus on the repetition of pink and green swaths of the building, he's flattened out the space and almost created an optical illusion. Much of the job of a photographer is to capture and record spaces, so space is a visual element that is vital to the practice of photography and photographic composition. Space in art is a dynamic visual element that interacts with all of the other visual elements we've discussed up until this point. Space is what defines all of the other elements. How could we have a line if there weren't any space around it to mark its edges? Two-dimensional space is the space of a flat surface, otherwise known as the picture plane, and it's the space we primarily deal with in photography. 
One of the goals of photographic composition is to create the illusion of three-dimensional space on the two-dimensional picture plane. And again, by training our eye to look for particular spaces or how objects sit in space, we can do just that. I mentioned in the last lecture group the term perspective. In addition to describing a photographer's point of view, perspective also describes how photographers organize the space of their shot or composition. Linear perspective is likely the type of perspective that you're most familiar with. It works based on two principles. The first is that forms diminish in size as we move away from them, and the second is that parallel lines receding into the distance seem to converge until they hit a vanishing point. You can see linear perspective at play here in this piece by Amy Stein. You can imagine that behind the truck is an infinite stretch of roadway. This photo is called Stranded, and you certainly get that sense. Atmospheric perspective is the idea that if you look off into the distance of a landscape, forms like mountains and hills appear paler, bluer, and less distinct. Isometric perspective occurs when parallel lines don't converge and there's no fixed viewpoint. In this image by Todd McClellan, you see an array of bits and pieces of an old phone. Because these pieces are without the context of converging lines or atmospheric effects, the space seems totally flat. It's almost difficult to distinguish that the objects are three-dimensional. All of the visual elements that we've talked about up until this point can more or less be defined by the spaces around them. Photographers use the last two elements I'm going to talk about, light and color, to help define space and refine their compositions. Light is the most important element to photography. After all, photography is literally capturing light. Light is the source of energy within any photographic image, and photographers used interesting light and shadow to model objects, giving them a three-dimensional appearance. In this photo by Manuel Alvarez Bravo, you can see how he pays very careful attention to the light and uses it to enhance our understanding of both the texture of the back wall and the masses of the sculptures. We can't see the source of light in the photo, but we can tell from the way the shadows fall that it's somewhere off to the right and the figures are looking right into it. How can we tell? Their faces are the brightest things and the left sides of their bodies sort of fade away into the shadows. Those shadows and the way they fall around and behind the figures enhance our perception of the figures as three-dimensional. We know that there's space behind them. Capturing light is another way of giving the illusion of space to a two-dimensional piece like a photograph. When we look at black and white photos like this one, we understand colors as values, or relative shades of light and dark. In Alvarez's photo, we can tell that the capes of the figures are darker than their robes because they are a darker shade or value of gray. Value exists in a seamless continuum from white being the lightest to black being the darkest and understanding this range of values helps a photographer make decisions about contrast. The visual element that likely gives us the most pleasure when looking at a piece of art is our final element, color. Color affects a big range of both emotional and physiological responses. Colors work on the brain in similar ways that light does. They affect our perception. For example, many restaurants decorate in red because red supposedly increases appetite. At the end of the day, though, color is just a function of light. Without light, there would be no color. We're familiar with color theory, principles of how colors work on the brain. And you all know a little bit about color theory already because you know the colors of the rainbow or the spectrum. You can thank Sir Isaac Newton who discovered gravity because he conducted experiments with light that gave us color theory. Back in 1666, Newton passed a ray of sunlight through a prism. He saw that the ray of light broke up or refracted into different colors that were arranged in the order of the colors of the rainbow. He then set up a second prism and combined the colors back into white light, proving that colors are just components of light. Just as works in black and white have a value scale, so do works in color. And colors have three properties, hue, or the color family it's in, value, its relative lightness or darkness, and intensity, the relative purity of color or saturation. 
Here's another image by Guillermo Srodek Hart, and you can see that he uses intense or saturated colors to make the objects pop out from the background. And here, Joel Sternfeld gives us a less intense or less saturated landscape with colors fading kind of into the dull uh, hues of autumn. Colors also have distinct relationships with each other, relationships we call harmonies. Complementary color harmonies have colors directly opposite each other on the color wheel. Analogous color harmonies combine colors next to each other on the color wheel. And triadic color harmonies involve any three colors equidistant to each other on the color wheel. I love this image by Brian Ulrich, which we've seen before, because I love his use of color. The intense colors here undermine the dumbness of the subject matter, and so there's a natural tension in the image that keeps my attention. In the next video, we'll look at several principles of design, or more simply put, ways of organizing all of these elements that we've looked at so that they work together to create a complete, resolved composition. Stay tuned.